This is Sophie and Bill Doyle on Vermont Issues. Um, our guest today is Michael Dumphy, the new editor of the Bridge newspaper here in Montpelier. And we're really grateful to have you here. We have so many questions and we're so proud of you for taking <laughs> on this big local project that is so important to so many people. Well, thank, thank you very you. much for the invitation. Yeah, it's a great honor. Well, we're, uh, we both are honored that you're here. So do you want to give us a little background sketch, maybe, of who you are and uh, how you ended up in Montpelier? Sure thing. It's a long, complicated story, and I'll try and keep it short. But I grew up in uh, Burlington, and uh, like many young people uh, at the age of 18, decided it was time to get out of Vermont. And I spent the next 20 years or so mostly living in Europe, where I was teaching English. And then eventually I fell into journalism uh, while I was living in Istanbul and changed direction in my life and uh, did move to New York City, was in Boston for a while, then was back in Europe. And then eventually I decided it was time to come home. And as I have so, many, uh, so much family in this area, uh, Montpelier was a, a good choice for me. Ah. And the, this job opened up at the bridge, so. And you found it when you were in Europe, right? I did, Because yes. you, Nat told me you had to come back for the job. Yes, I'm, I'm hoping I'm the first person ever to move directly from Prague to Montpelier. <laughs> your, dr your dream to the bridge. Um, in terms of the bridge, I mean, the first sort of dream is, you know, survival and thriving, that the bridge not only survives but thrives, which is a very uh, difficult thing to do in um, the print world these days, in the, the media world right now. Now, but beyond you, that... But you have a paper that uh, has a good record, so you, you're, you're coming in on the heels of a bridge that's very well appreciated by the uh, people who read it. They are, and it's amazing to walk into a publication that already has such a devoted readership. That's, that's a unicorn in many respects, and I, I'm very uh, appreciative and grateful for that. Um, but in terms of where I would like to go with the bridge, I very much look to Seven Days as a model, I would say, for, for many reasons, uh, mainly because they are an example of a successful print-based publication uh, within free. Vermont that's free and is doing pretty good business. And so I think they're a great model, but obviously we want to distinguish ourselves in our own way and, and not just be a copy of that. But there are many things that they do that fit with, within us. For example, um, they're weekly, we're bi-weekly, but we both have a, the similar issue of we can't really leap on as easily to breaking news. It's not what we do, so we have to select our stories and do those deep dives. Um, and I like that idea of, of taking the threads of the stories and really going into them uh, deeply, as deeply as we can. And I don't know how many publications are, are doing that at the moment uh, within the state. So, I think we're pretty good about that, and I like the idea of doing that more as well as and mixing the hard and the soft news as, as best we can. Well, never before in our history have journalists such as yourself under attack. You, you want to make, make any comments? Because uh, I've, the, the uh, conversation and what's been written about the journalists by some um, have, have certainly been not favorable to the press. So how would you handle that? It's a very good question, and luckily, uh, you know, thus far, the, the general types of journalism that I've been doing, I haven't really been personally uh, attacked or, or whatever related to that, but obviously it's on everybody's, every journalist who's writing now has this on their mind, and it, there doesn't seem to be a day that goes by where there's not another terrible story of, of a journalist killed, as, you know, like in recently the, the Saudi journalist in Turkey and the one in Bulgaria. And it's a very dangerous profession, and it's really, people are afraid of the truth. And, um, and if, if anything, it demonstrates the power and the need of journalism that it would frighten people so much um, that this would be their response. You know, that journalists are more dangerous than anybody else because <coughs> they bring the truth, or they certainly try to. And uh, I think, if anything, it underscores the importance of it. And I think we are seeing some of that realization, I think, in the in the past years, especially in, in the Trump years and all that, that there is a, a renewed support for uh, the kind of journalism that should be. So if there is a silver lining, um, that could be one. But 
but yes, it's something we're all very, very deeply concerned. And I guess we hope that in the end, it's the work that will say more than we can, that the value of the work and the quality of the work and the benefit it gives to the society is really the best response you can give to that sort of attacks, you know, is do your job well. Yeah. I was saying to Bill, it's wonderful reading The Bridge because, you know, you get so isolated in your own world. And then you wonder, well, what's the outcome of this situation? Or what's the outcome of that situation? And I always find the answer in The Bridge. <laughs> well, that's, that's wonderful. but Which is really great. I think the name of The Bridge is, is something that links to what you're saying there. And that a strong community requires strong communication. And in our especially digital world, which is very cocoonish of everybody on their phones and everything, you know, we, we're lacking more and more of that communication, which I think we can see manifest in, in, in many ways. And so, you know, the name of the bridge as a connector has a symbolic meaning. And, and part of what we're trying to do is to keep those connections and keep those conversations going. And, and through that is where we build the stronger uh, community and the stronger society, I think. Mike, what were some of the influences that got at why you made a career choice? Well, initially, as I said, I, I got into journalism when I was uh, abroad. And if you're, come, if you're a boy who grew up in Vermont and then suddenly you're in a place like Istanbul or places like that, it's, it's so overwhelming and there's so many stories and adventures and, and things you want to tell people, you know, the things you experience, or at least I did. And it just started there with me just wanting to tell those stories. And, and you know, it began in private journals and then little newsletters and then little blogs. And then you just it kept going up the ladder. But it was just wanting to tell these stories. And where were you, lo were you located in Europe? A number of places. So uh, I was in the UK for a year. I was in uh, Czech Republic for two years. I was in Estonia for three years. And I was in Turkey for four years and then a few, a whole bunch of other places for some months at a time. So it was really all over the place. It was, it was uh, on the road, I would say, in many ways, but they have very good trains there, so it's more on the rails. When I was speaking that. Say more about the rails that you just talked about. You mentioned. Well, it's, it's, it's wonderful, and this is actually, you know, at 43, moving back to Vermont, this is the first time I've ever had to own a car, <laughs> which is sort of shocking, and I, I admit I do miss that the wonderful connected uh, train systems in, in Europe that are, you know, we were on a, you know, we were on a train in Switzerland a, like a little while ago and, and we had first class tickets and we were in the second class and thought we were in the first class. Ah. You know, it's just, and then you get on the Amtrak or, or, or and it's just striking how different it is. And so I, I found that wonderful. I do miss that, yes. Were you writing for um, English speaking papers or yes. were you and so you had a sort of community that you were working with there yes I mean most freelancers and surviving as a freelancer whether it's a writer or whatever you develop networks and you develop relationships with different people so I had enough success to have a, a network of people that would always employ me so I had a lot of work coming to me on a regular basis I didn't have to go look looking for it all the time um, would it be transferred back to the states as well, or did it mainly your writing mainly stayed in Europe? No, they were mostly for uh, U American and uh, British publications, ah. and, and then of course if it's on the web, it's international. Oh. So the paychecks were coming from here. What tools did you bring back from Europe? Tools. Well, certainly for this position, I, I guess journalistic tools and, and the experience in writing all. I don't know if it's necessarily from travel, but just from being a freelancer for so many years in New York, in Europe, in Boston, and learning how to, the hustle of it and the hard work that it requires, and really how to network and, and schmooze, and, and how talent in writing or talent in art is almost secondary to sort of the management and the hustle and the effort that's required and the, and the relationships you build. And in, in many ways, that is something that's important here. A lot of the stories we get uh, at the bridge or we're gonna write about come from us having relationships with people and relationships to community members who want to speak with us or trust us 
or are willing to share information with us. Um, I'm, I'm sure most new pa newspapers would say the same. It's, it's this building of relationships, um, I think, is, is very helpful. And then learning how to translate those ideas into a printed form or, you know, it's, it's one thing to have the idea for something, but then how do you translate that into a 800 words in a specific format that, in, in a skillful way? Public conversation. Yeah. So. What do you like to schmooze about most? <laughs> well, if I'm actually schmoozing, I don't do much of the talking because I have I found that the best strategy with schmoozing is you get the other person to do most of the talking. <laughs> if you if you allow someone the ability or the chance to talk about how great they are, they usually like you. It's a little cynical, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly worked in New York. So we want to know. <laughs> Bill and I are great food lovers. We believe in energy through good food, and we heard that you got to be a food writer. And can you tell us of an, an adventure that, that sort of got you into, or a new food you discovered because of it, or um, a highlight? I would say the benefits of being a food writer is that you get to eat a lot of things you could never afford ah. as a food writer, because they would cost more to get than you would ever make from writing. So, and, and many times they're amazing, and sometimes I almost would rather have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I was in Amsterdam once, and they gave me one of those real Wagyu uh, things that was like a $200, th you know, filet, and like, they brought it to me, and, and the person next to me was having like fish and chips, and I wanted the fish and chips. It's just like, so sometimes when you go to that level, it's, it's not as great as you as you uh, might think. Well, let's talk about some of the countries that you've been to sure. and associate the meals that, uh, that identify a good, a good meal in, the, in each country that you, you can remember at this time. Well, probably altogether, Turkey was probably the most amazing for food. I mean, just the whole cultural and ethnic confluence that has occurred there and all of the unbelievable food, especially if you're coming from like northern New England. You know, um, whether there were specific dishes, I mean, it w there were so many, I, I couldn't, I mean, there was one I, I really loved that was called the Sultan's Delight, which was like a, a smoked mashed eggplant with like very tender lamb chunks on top, and th I adored that. And, um, and then, but, you know, the, the fish was great, and, and I mean, I could go on and on and on about it. I really can't. It's difficult to choose one, and the desserts, my God, that's my guilty pleasures. I have a sweet tooth, so just unbelievable desserts of baklava and, and all that sort of rose. It's always full of rose water and honey, at, you know, in, in that area, mm. and the phyllo breads mm. and the nuts um, and and the fruit, you know, figs and, and all that sort of thing. Again, if you're coming from from Vermont, that was always pretty amazing to me. So overall, I would say culinarily, Turkey was the best for sure. How far were you from the Mediterranean? Um, well, you know, the Mediterranean has many different components. So Istanbul is on the, on the Sea of Marmara and the Bosphorus, which connects to the, you know, Aegean, which is part of the Mediterranean. So, um, so it just depends kind of a bit how you define, you want to define Mediterranean. But I mean, you know, you could smell the salt and, and look out your window and see it uh, because Istanbul is, has many hills, seven like Rome, which is part of why they put it there. Um, so it's very elevated, so you have these great views. And uh, I was on the, um, on the Adriatic for a year when I was in, in Croatia and Slovenia, and again, the food there uh, was, was pretty amazing as well. Uh, one particular dish that came to mind was like they would take calamari and they would stuff the hoods with like, I think it was mascarpone cheese and prosciutto and then grill that. Wow. Exactly, or they would, they had wild asparagus there, which I had never had. Like it's it's much smaller and thinner than what you get, but it grew everywhere. But it was very had a much more pungent taste. Sophie and I have a long way to go to match what you just said. <laughs> and uh, so they would scramble that with eggs in the morning and prosciutto, and uh, I thought. And then the, they always put a dose of olive oil on it, which my landlord made, and that was amazing. So he would just leave me bottles of of olive oil that he made at my uh, door, and wine, and grappa. 
<laughs> and uh, so that came with the extra love. Right. Why did you come back? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. That's a good question. <laughs> I do wake up some days and wonder about that. But it is, um, at a certain point, you know, I think maybe to some degree when you cross that 40 threshold. And, uh, and I had been doing it a very long time. It wasn't just a year or two. We're talking about 15 years of it, of, years. of living in a bag and the constant moving and constantly having to say goodbye to people. Mm. And that's not fun. And then as you get older, it's just not the same. So, you know, most people have children and families and mortgages and careers and they don't have the energy. So they're not as available. So if you meet somebody really interesting, they say, well, maybe next month on a Tuesday from three to four when my kids at daycare, I might have time to, you know, to hang out with you. So um, describe your favorite dinner. Uh, you mean when I was abroad? Well, I didn't pick any period of time. Well, if it was in Vermont, it would be lobster, obviously, right. but because you can't get I'm, that's I'm, one I'm thing. I'm talking about overseas. Oh uh, boy, I think some of the ones I mentioned for Turkey were were really there. But I think you tie up food with you don't just isolate the food by itself. It, it's connected to stories and nostalgic feelings and experiences you have, and you and you put those all together. So. You know, when I think of the idea of, of sitting on the GNC, you know, with my friends and, and having, uh, you know, the, the fish and the raka, which is like the liquor they have there. Um, I mean, it's just hard to beat that. Now, did you go to college with the intention of being a writer or is that something? No, that I went to college because I had no idea what to do. And ah, in college, I had, uh, you, well, I ended up going to three, but I graduated from UVM. What were the other two? Uh, I started at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Okay. Um, and then, of course, if you've ever been to Poughkeepsie, there's your answer why I left. <laughs> and then I went to UVM, and then I got a scholarship to study in the UK. So I was in Canterbury for a year. And that was kind of where the travel bug uh, started. And then I came back to UVM and, and finished out there and got my degree there, which was just in English and history. And um, really what happened was, in my last class, uh, when I suddenly realized, okay, this is all gonna end soon and I don't know how to do anything, and I don't see any job advertisements for like Marxist criticism you know, in literature, uh, somebody came into the class from the Peace Corps and was just, here's a job, here's travel, here's deferments on your student loans, it's great on your resume, and I thought that sounded great, let's do that. So that's what you did, you got out of college and joined the Peace Corps. I did. Okay, and then? And then I was an English teacher uh, in a little village in the southwest of Estonia for about two and a half years. And obviously you do a lot of traveling because you have great train systems and just the opportunity. And I really liked Eastern Europe much more because it had so much more authenticity to it, I felt, and it was 100 times cheaper and, and more undiscovered, you know. Did they make you sing? In oh, Estonia? Yes. Oh, yes. Have you got a little ditty you could sing for us? <laughs> Estonia is, well, you can tell the story better than I, um, but they separated from the USSR from singing, through singing, right? They yes. had the well, singing revolution? They did. Their, I love that story. Their revolution, they called it the singing revolution, um, which is somewhat controversial in the area if you speak to the Latvians and the Lithuanians, but that's another story. And also um, Estonians. Huh? And the Estonians. Well, no, they, they presented it as we sang and we were free. Okay. Um, and they all, and that's so, but the important thing is that song in their culture is so important to their identity as a culture. And when I was working in the schools, they, they put a lot of effort in teaching children song and dance, mm. um, especially the traditional ones. And it was always like embarrassing when they would ask me to sing a traditional American song and all you can think are like, Coca-Cola commercials, and oh, no, I want to buy worse. the world a Coke, or you're like, okay, she's coming around the mountain, maybe, <laughs> but I, or you know a few lines here and there, but they have these incredible bodies of, of works, and I, I did lear learn a couple of them just to win, try to win their love, because I needed to. My own memory was uh, seeing a class in Czechoslovakia, and teaching English in Czechoslovakia. Not, not that I did, but it was being taught. Yes. But that's, that, you're right, but that's, that's a general thing through most of Eastern Europe because, you know, of, 
of, there are many evils that they, you can point to that, that communism and the Iron, Iron Curtain did in that part of the world, but it also kind of pickled it. And in the sense that if it wasn't destroyed during the war, it was kind of preserved because they didn't do any urban development programs. They were very much about keeping people connected to their folk sort of traditions. They didn't have, you know, everything that we did. So once they sort of became free in the late 80s or whatever, those things were still pretty much intact. So they could still do their dances and still do their songs. And the cities were, you know, very kind of, as I said, authentic. They hadn't been redeveloped um, or, or even cleaned up at all. Um, yeah. So you would still walk, you know, in the streets of, of Budapest and there's a hundred years of soot, you know, there and there's so much history in that soot. Um, right, just Like palpable soot. history. Oh, and I just, I always love that. So that was something I, I noticed a lot there that I really appreciated. So I have one question here. Um, you were saying that part of your career was uh, sort of international information swapping, you know. I mean, you were writing for the United States, and was that a lot of that was online, probably? A and mix. So the bridge is all printed. Yes. I mean, you must have some dedication to print in some way, or some um, dream, or. I wouldn't say part this is of it that you feel is so important that you need to support it. The dedication, I would say, is not to print as itself as a medium so much, but as to what, in terms of the bridge, local journalism can do that the large digital giants are not doing. And if that's in print or if that's digital, uh, it doesn't make as much of a difference to me, um, at least in that sense. So as, as I mentioned to you, you know, I've, I've worked in the past for a lot of these large companies like uh, USA Today and CNN and, and these, and I know how they choose which news to write and which news to publish. And it's very soul crushing uh, if you're in it um, because you, many people go into writing in the arts and journalism with a very like idealistic sense of I'm going to be Woodward and Bernstein or, or something like that. And then the reality of, of the business of digital media and what drives the business is very different. And so I associate with the bridge a, a very more traditional, and I would say this is the purest form of journalism I've ever been able to do where we can really just sit down and discuss um, at the editorial table what are the important stories we think for the community and you know what will be a help, what will be a support. And that conversation just never happened at almost any of those other places I worked. And what were some of these stories that you did learn about and which you liked so much? In, in the bridge? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's very much, news in Montpelier is in many ways is very much like what they call a tempest in a teapot. Uh, so I'm like working on the story on the parking garage now and of course it's just if you drop it's that. It's a hot it, topic right now. Right, but it's just, it, it's always, it's important, but I, I do get a certain sense of amusement of the, of the fervor it brings and the passion it brings to the communities because people love this community and, and they have a vision of this community and that's wonderful. So. Um, I'm very much trying to also do stories that go beyond this community and that are state stories. So meaning that uh, anybody in the state could read the story and it would be of value to them. So I recent, or we recently did a piece about you know, Lake Champlain and um, the bill that uh, Peter Welch did and all the pollution and phosphorus issues. And that's, that's a story anybody in the state <coughs> we hope would find value in. Let's get back to travel. The, sure. <laughs> the, cost, the cost of travel and name some places the subways took you to that, that were sort of outstanding. Well, I mean, in the cost of travel, the best way to do it is to get somebody else to pay for it. And so a lot of being a travel journalist is, is a way to travel and, and, and teach English is a way to do it, but get somebody else to pay for it or make it affordable. So in terms of the cost, I could never have done any of those things if I was just traveling on my own. What would be a typical cost if you had to pay for it? Well, I can talk about, for example, uh, in Prague, where I was before I came here, because that's more fresh in my memory. And the cost of living there was just so much less. So I had a one-bedroom apartment in the center of, of the city for about 500 bucks a month. What city was that? This is Prague. 
uh, you know, my health care and dental total coverage was $85 a month. Um, the, you know, of course, they're famous for beer, so that was like a dollar. I mean, you could go out to a nice restaurant, I mean, a nice restaurant, and, and have a full three courses for maybe about 15 bucks. Um, so if you're, so the ultimate goal of a lot of expats uh, in these areas is if they can bring a Western salary into these right. parts of the world, you can live really, really well. And then, of course, there's the whole uh, foreign exclusion tax, which is uh, another good reason to move abroad if you're American. Cause what do you consider a Western salary? Uh, well, a Western salary, you know, I, I suppose somewhere around that forty to 50000 range a year at the minimum. Okay. Um, but if you take that and, you know, if the 40000 let's say, would get me a lot further in Prague than it would in Montpelier hmm. um, for lots of reasons. So there's, there's a certain whole group of, of expats that have worked hard to create that lifestyle because you can survive on so much less. And were there s specific countries that you found those communities in versus England, for example? <laughs> Well, I mean, Prague, of course, is a huge one. Budapest uh -huh. is a huge expat. Uh, um, Istanbul was, but that has changed, unfortunately, a lot. But when I was there, it was a huge expat community. But almost everybody I know has left for, for all the reasons that are happening in that part of the world. Um, so there is some shifting around. So, you know, they all migrate. It's sort of like neighborhoods in New York. They all migrate to the sort of the, the poorer cities that... And, and then they make that cool, and then it becomes the land values and the rental values go up, and then they move to the next city in the sort of constant progression. So now I hear Albania is quite popular among the expat groups, so oh, like Tirana in those areas, and Montenegro. And so there's just a, this constant movement because oh, wow. Budapest is getting too expensive. You know? And some people like living in, in kind of on the edge. Or Lviv in Ukraine is another one that's getting quite popular now for expats. Ah. Um, so there's a, a shift to the east, just like Brooklyn. <laughs> so how many languages did you manage to learn on this 20 years of adventure? I would say I was never fluent, but I was pretty functional. Uh, probably I was the best in Turkish, um, and I can still do a pretty good job, so it's always <coughs> fun to shock Turkish people in Vermont because they, wouldn't, they would never expect. There was a group walking around. Uh, Montpelier some some months ago and I, I jumped into their conversation and their jaws dropped and I always love that um, although strangely I guess I look like there's a Turkish celebrity I look like and so they always point that out oh, that and they did true. in that group they're like you're like that guy and um, Estonian I was pretty good in but that was so long ago that I really lost it and then you know I can do some Italian and some French and, and a, a bit of Russian and a smattering of a lot of other languages. But the interesting thing with languages in most countries, all you need to do is give a couple words and they love you. Um, they, they, maybe not so much in France, Germany, Italy, where it's a little more expected. You need 200. <laughs> but if you, if you go to Estonia, you know, and you say like, thank you very much or hello, they, they're, sh they're amazed and they, and they absolutely embrace you. Aww. And so language um, or making an effort at the language, um, goes a long way to building those relationships because uh, people will respect you and then they'll want to talk to you if you make the effort to embrace their culture. And I certainly found that in Turkey, uh, for sure, um, because I'm clearly much more of an outsider. Well, Turkey has gone through some economic uh, problems. Uh, were they, and did they surface when you were there? Um, I mean, I think that's a part of a world that's always been in volatility for forever. So when I was there, though, I was kind of towards the tail end of that very good period. Um, so that was 2005 to 2009. And um, in fact, there were periods where the lira was almost on par with the dollar. It was so strong. Um, and pretty much after I left, uh, everything started to, to really go downhill. I don't think there's a causation there, but maybe a correlation. Um, so I didn't really see too much of that other than when, but, but then at the same time, there's a lot more extreme levels of poverty uh, that you would never see here or you wouldn't see here in the States as much. So you could just go a couple neighborhoods over and you would see neighborhoods that with really extreme levels of, of poverty in, in a different way. Um, 
So it's very difficult to, to sort of pinpoint it. But certainly lately, yes, it's been uh, more severe. Thank you. Well, we're pretty much out of time, but we want to thank you so much for coming in and talking with us. It's been wonderful to have you divulge your adventures to us. And I thank you very much, yes. It's we're very grateful to have an open eye and an open heart on the bridge because that is, like you say, exactly what it is, and it's super important to the people of Montpelier mm. as a resource for information, but also, like you say, to know what our culture is here, here's what's important, and who is here. Here's the final follow-up. Anything we should have asked you, what you would like, would we, you would have liked us to ask you? I think really one thing I just want to emphasize, as, as I mentioned before, is how the approach to news that the bridge is taking and how increasingly rare that is um, with, with the digital media world. And, and I know that in a very personal way. So supporting the bridge in many ways, whether it's just reading it or, or more, really does keep that valuable form of journalism alive. Um, and even if it's not the bridge, I just encourage everybody to support their local papers because they are doing a very valuable uh, resource. For those not aware, where is the bridge located? Up at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. Okay. And uh, you're always welcome to stop by. People do. It's always a hoot. Yeah, beware. <laughs> well, that's part of the fun. As, I, as I, I've often pointed out that I feel like my job is a Netflix show in waiting. Yeah. And it's like Northern Exposure meets Parks and Recreation. That, that's how I feel, but it's very enjoyable. I used to love harassing Nat. Well, very satisfying. We still accept harassment. <laughs> well, Nat can give as good as he gets. He's probably better. Well, He's pretty good at a match. Thank you very much for this wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank Both you. Both of you. Thank it's really you. a pleasure. Yes. Good luck to you. To thank the you very much, Bill.